Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Challenging Behaviour, Your Role as a Team Member. Our presenter is Nicole Nash-Arnold from Nurse Manager HQ. Nicole is a nursing career coach who helps great nurses transform into respected leaders. She shares her 15 years of experience in both senior and executive health leadership roles to germinate great leadership. Clinically, Nicole has over 10 years perioperative experience before moving into her nurse educator and management roles. Nicole has postgraduate qualifications in perioperative nursing and currently a Masters in Nursing. Nicole is a member of the International Coaches Federation. Nicole, welcome to the microphone. Thanks very much, Sue. Um, yeah, so today I'm talking about challenging behaviour um, and what your role is in that. And in fact, it's part of a three-part series that I'm going to talk about. And the first part is your role in, in challenging difficult behaviours. There's certainly no doubt that us in the nursing world, irrespective of whether in a hospital or community or residential aged care facility or wherever we deliver our nursing care, it's almost universally with other people. And that presents some challenges because not everybody thinks the way that we think and has different values, beliefs and the ways in which they communicate can be really different. And so this presentation is not necessarily about the fact that people are different. It's about the very select subgroup of people that present with very challenging behaviours. And they make our life quite difficult. And we often feel like it's the nurse manager's responsibility to deal with that challenging behaviour. But actually, there's a lot of work that needs to go before we get to knocking on the nurse manager's door about it um, that we can do to try and confront that behaviour. And not only is it your role, but it is your responsibility as part of that team to be able to give people the natural justice, to know that their behaviour is challenging and to see how they can change it before we go knocking on the uh, nurse manager's door and escalating it to a much more formal process. So that's what we're going to talk about today, is we're going to give you, an unpack what challenging behaviours we're really talking about. They're many and they're varied, um, but we're going to have a look at the most common, what I've found to be the most common challenging behaviours in a clinical setting, and some strategies for you to be able to deal with it in its first instance. So of course there is always a spectrum, like everything in life, there's the yin and the yang. And so we have on one end of that continuum, we have got the picture perfect employee. On the other end of the spectrum, we have a very select subgroup, which are the very toxic psychopaths. Some people, the psychos in the workplace is what some people call them. But we know them more commonly as those who are bullies um, and harassers. And from the outset, it's important to point out that that's not who we're talking about today. That sort of behaviour is something outside the scope of this, um, this conversation that we're having. But what we are talking about is the behaviour that lies somewhere on the right of a continuum that you can see on, on the screen, that it is not, not on the perfect side, but it is on the negative side. So when we look at that spectrum, then we're looking at the high performer. And the high performer is the person that is motivated, takes initiative, highly competent. They're very, very good clinical performers. They take ownership for their work and their mistakes and for what they don't know. They're often lifelong learners. They're very open-minded. They're very controlled. They see change as opportunities rather than a challenge and something that's confronting. They're great communicators. Then they show lots of other characteristics. They're team players with a great deal of integrity. They have a great work ethic, they take pride in their work, they give input and they take feedback. They often network and they seek feedback on their performance and look for opportunities to stretch themselves. And they direct their own learning and they know their boundaries and they know when to say no. So when we're talking about the other end of the spectrum, then we are talking about the bullies. Now, to be clear, and each and every one of you who's listening to this webinar will be contractually and legally required to do bullying and harassment training every single year. So this concept won't be new to you. 
that bullying is something that is, according to the uh, WorkSafe Queensland Department, repeated and unreasonable behaviour directed towards a worker or group of workers that creates a risk to workplace health and safety. So when we talk about unreasonable behaviour, it means that behaviour that is that a reasonable person, having considered the circumstances, would see as unreasonable including behaviour such as victimising, humiliating, intimidating or threatening. So as we move through this presentation, we're talking about bad behaviour. It must be clear that we're not talking about bullying behaviour. That as we walk down the street and we ask 10 people down the street, have you ever behaved in this way, that the majority of the people would say, yeah, I've had a bad day and I've behaved in a snappy way or I've behaved in an aggressive way or I've dropped my bundle and lost the plot at somebody or, you know, I've manipulated an outcome that I wanted for myself and it cost someone else something. No, it's if seven or eight people down the street would say, yeah, I've done that one time, you know, a couple of times, then it's something that we would describe as bad behaviour. The bullying in terms of what's unreasonable is if you walk down the street and ask 10 people, have you victimised somebody? Have you threatened them and humiliated them and intimidated them? Then the answer to that would be no. So that sort of abusive, insulting, offensive, unjustified criticism and complaints, um, those sorts of things is not what we're talking about in this presentation. As we go through a couple of the profiles um, of bad behaviour, then you will see some of those behaviours that you see in bullies, in that very extreme case of the bully, where it has moved from what we've all done at one point or another because we've been girl behaving badly, but when it moves into something that's unreasonable and it's unjustified and it is deliberately gone about to hurt somebody, then that's the bullying phase of it that we are not talking about. We are just talking about a girl behaving badly. So to that end, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the bad behaviours that I have seen most frequently in my time as I have managed many, many clinical departments. So these are my dark forces that I find that are the frequent flyers that we will talk about. So as we move through each and every one of them, then I would describe them as this. The bad behaviour, bad behaviours might be someone that who is bossy, otherwise known as the informal leaders. They certainly aren't the manager, but they behave as if they are. They could also be known as the tribal leader sometimes. People in the team, in the broader nursing team, will look to this person and often check first about what they should think before they formulate their own opinion. They're all, there's always a manager in every clinical department, but that person isn't always the tribal leader. And in fact, almost across the board, there will be two different man in those capacities. One will be the manager and one will be the tribal leader. So that tribal leader can be a very positive influence, but sometimes they can either use those powers for good or they can use it for evil. And we're going to look more closely at the evil version and the real dictator of the ward later on. But they're usually very bossy and they're the ones that cause the call the shots. The next one is the brutal. Now we are, I would be surprised if any nurse that I've that I've come across hadn't come across a nurse at one point that was brutal. They are brutal with their feedback. We said we wanted honesty in our ward, but they added the brutal honesty to the honest, to the brutal part. There's no holding back. These people have never heard of political correctness, just an acid tongue. Grads falter in their wake. Even the experienced RNs who've been in the ward for a long time uh, avoid her when she's on the war path. She doesn't tolerate fools. She doesn't accept mistakes. She rips you into you the minute she finds out that there's something gone wrong or we haven't, we've breached some infraction of what she considers the basic nursing cares. And if she comes across of that and then look out, you're in for it. She is absolutely cutting in the way in which she delivers feedback and communication. My next classic bad behaviour is the lazy. Again, there's always a lazy in every single department. 
they find the most extraordinary ways of suddenly disappearing when extra tasks are being handed out. Sometimes lazy is so brazen about squirming out of work, it's unbelievable. Somehow they always find themselves in the tea room. They always find themselves with the lightest patient load. Look more deeply at their work and the content of their work, then you're sure to find a great deal of corners that have been cut. My, one of my personal favourite is busy. Of all of the bad behaviours, this probably is the one personally that drives me most nuts. The busyness, so busy. Oh, couldn't possibly do this and don't have time to do that and I can never get to my tea breaks and but now I'm ready two hours later that it's too late now. So very, very busy. Take a good look and there's a lot more flurry and buster, bluster than actual action. There's a lot of inefficient back and forth from patient to drug room to nurse's station without anything actually going on in between those stops, just lots of walking. People try to help, but it's impossible to make head nor tail of where on earth she is up to. If you approach her and say, can I do this for you? Can I give the IV antibiotics to bed 10 for you? It makes her more flustered and quite snarky because that would just throws her whole thought process about where she's at and what she's doing and she can't possibly even get out of her own way to be able to delegate. Next is the bizarre. Again, I think most departments will have someone that is a little odd. That weird, quirky little dude whose mannerisms are strange enough to be quietly off-putting. You see him walking and talking to patients in the same manner and you often wonder what on earth the patients are thinking, the poor things. He talks incessantly, incessantly in the nurse's station, in the tea room, in the drug room, and you're never quite sure exactly what you're having a conversation about. It's all very strange. And for the nurse manager, one of her staff, this is one of her staff that she probably receives the most complaints about from the broader nursing roster. Inappropriate conversation, inappropriate with patients, too much talking and lazy, worried about him in an emergency, worried about whether he can identify the deteriorating patient. It is a general unsettled malcontent and lack of trust about bizarre. Next is the treacherous, uh, the manager's absolute worst nightmare. Treacherous is the town cynic, hates everything, every new idea, every new form, every new changing process, every policy is ridiculous, often says things like the way we did it at St Elsewhere, well that was the correct way, this place, terrible, dangerous comes to every single staff meeting but never contributes. Well, doesn't contribute in the staff meeting, but she's got loads to say immediately after the staff meeting. Corridor consultations with everyone about, did you hear what happened at the staff meeting? Well, let me tell you. If it's not the nurse manager that's the centre of her target, then it's the hospital or the organisation. Now, this one might be a strange one for you, but miss the, the ones who hold the knowledge. You may think knowledge is a go good thing, and of course, it absolutely is. But sometimes you get too much of a good thing. Knowledge is the guy that always knows everything. doesn't matter what's come into the unit, a raging PE that's deteriorating out of control, a dice, unstable diabetic, acute delirium, postpartum hemorrhage, he's the expert. Yet looked after all of those. When I was in London, you know, blah, blah, blah. When I worked in the Congo, whilst I was working in the States, if you thought about it fully, then this person would have to be around 153 to have done everything that they claim to have done and known. But they seem to put their foot down and be front and centre with every acute, unstable, exciting patient because they believe they're the only ones who can truly properly care for this patient. Critical the micromanager. This is the nurse that casts the scrutinising eye over everything that everyone does. There's no discrimination to whom is scanned by her all-seeing eye. And one minor step outside her expectations, irrespective of whether it's best practice or policy, then she's all over you explaining what you've done wrong and why and how you should have done it better. Frustrating little quirks like asking you to do something that you've actually just stood up to do pointing out your mistake when you already know you've made it. 
it sometimes feels all very passive aggressive. And last, the combative. This is the person who is incredibly oversensitive and reacts disproportionately. Small criticisms, minor untoward events, people disagreeing with her, hospital coordinators not responding quickly enough or the way she thinks it should happen, patients who are mildly difficult or, God forbid, ask too many questions, that's too busy or it's too quiet, the orderly is not doing the work quick enough. Everything is met with an almost explosive emotion. The tension can be felt through the whole unit and you have an overwhelming urge to say, goodness sake, calm your farm. But of course you dare not because that would be like throwing a thermonuclear device into an already very volatile individual. There are many other examples of what poor behaviour might look like, but in my experience, most people fall into one of those two boxes. And so when you're working with those people, then the question might be, what's the threshold? What, how much do I put up with? And how do I know when it's up to, when it's time to say, no, that's the line in the sand. We've got to address this behaviour and change the way in which you're engaging with our team. How do you know when to say enough is enough? And most importantly, when is it your job to say and to draw that line and to define that threshold? And when is it appropriate to escalate it to the nurse manager? So to that end, I have two rules, and they're pretty simple. Two questions you ask yourself in every single situation. Does the behaviour affect team cohesion and or does it affect patient care? They're the most important questions in this. This will be the test that you apply to every single bad behaviour that you come across. And it will be the test that defines whether you're going to deal with it or not. We'll deal with the how you deal with it later on in the presentation. But at the moment, we're going to run through a few test cases with how you might apply that test. So in terms of what's the threshold, we, this will help you answer how do I know when enough is enough? But that, this question won't necessarily answer the second question, which is when is it the nun's job? We'll answer that as well later. But first we're going to go through each of our bad behaviours and that we were introduced for, to just a second ago and work out how they, how they sit across these two test questions. That does it affect team cohesion and does it affect patient care? So first we're going to have a look at treacherous. So treachery is the person that's running around hating on everything that the manager or the organisation is doing. There's corridor conversations that are up there with the halls of Parliament House in Canberra, with backroom do deals and whispering theories and garnering for support. Support for what is unclear, but generally those corridor conversations are wildly happening. So let's test this behaviour with my two questions. Now, admittedly, I'm a nurse manager and I have been for a long, a long time. So I am coming from the nurse manager position. So the treacherous staff member is a massive headache for all of us who are nuns countrywide. Putting my bias aside as much as I possibly can, I can still see that this behaviour is enormously counterproductive to the team's cohesion. It's undermining. It plants seeds of doubt in the people that are otherwise doing good work and delivering excellent patient care. Let's take a very specific example. Say the nun has announced a change in the patient cohort that they'll be taking on this ward because one of their largest volume doctors has resigned and moved to another hospital. So they have been medical for all of this time, but now he's going to that resignation is going to massively impact the amount, of, behave, the amount of, um, of his sorts of patients that are going to be on the ward. So to that end, um, they're going to start taking outliers from the rest of the hospital. Treachery, after this meeting, now runs the corridors of this medical ward and says, don't you see, the hospital sacked that doctor because they don't want us anymore. You see, they, we don't make any money for the hospital. So that's what they're doing. It's the start of them shutting us down. They want more orthopaedics. They don't want us. So, you know, we won't have jobs soon. They'll just fill us with orthopaedics. Now, treachery has turned a simple, 
albeit very disappointing loss of a key doctor, into a fear campaign that soon people will be made redundant. It's damaging to the team categorically. So as a point one, if you're passing through the test of does it impact team cohesion, then it is uncategorically, categorically um, affecting the team. It's arguably even damaging patient care because suddenly nurses' minds are not on the task. They're suddenly obsessing about how they're going to pay a mortgage in a couple of months and not on the drug calculation for the insulin infusion that they're currently preparing. So this is something, if we're going to decide whether this is something that meets that threshold of whether I need to address it or not, it's definitely affecting the patient, the team. It's arguably is affecting the patient. So therefore, it's something that needs to be addressed. Again, as I said earlier, we'll talk about how a little later. But at the moment, treachery is undermining and causing malcontent that may or may not exist. So it is something that needs to be addressed. Let's talk about Mr Quirky. We have our weird little dude. The nun has taken a bucket full of complaints about this guy and how his behaviour is inappropriate. Again, if we take a very specific example then, our quirky guy, Eugene, went to Mexico some time ago and had a life-changing experience. He was exposed to a very unusual subculture and absolutely fell in love with it and started his own subculture club here at home. The subculture is shoes. There's an area in Mexico where wearing large, colourful, sparkly, pointed shoes is all the rage. Resembling shoes that are worn by court jesters in medieval times, these shoes are worn by traditional music enthusiasts and there's competitions for who can wear the pointiest dance shoes. Eugene has taken his subculture to the extreme and other than when he changes his shoes at the ward door, you'll never see him out of his highly pointed jester shoes. He loves it dearly and he talks about it a lot. He talks about it in the nurse's station, he talks about it in the DD cupboard, he he's, talks about in the um, nurse's station about his latest creation, he, in his breaks he's reading books on more creations and dealing with group gatherings and he talks to patients about it. Other nurses think that it's quite weird and have interpreted it as a shoe fetish. So when they hear him talk to patients about his shoe fetish, fetish they raise it because they feel like the content is inappropriate and they raised it with the nun. Now, if we apply our filters first of team cohesion, other than people not understanding that this is an innocent hobby, albeit extreme and unusual, it's not a fetish. And I would have trouble seeing an argument that it would be impacting on team cohesion. You would have to objectively scan patients if you were applying test number two, is, is it affecting patient care? You would have to objectively scan them and see how they're reacting to this conversation when Eugene tells them about the latest shoe he was creating and where the, where, how he found out about it and the story about Mexico. If you found that they were um, reacting in a way that was mildly interested and possibly quite perplexed, about how someone could find this so passionately interesting, but they were genuinely feeding back, asking questions, and where do you find the shoes to buy, and where do you go find the dancers to go to, you could probably consider that the patients were indeed safe and unaffected. And so Eugene would get a pass from me in terms of whether it, were, it reached that threshold. He's certainly weird and it's certainly unusual, but at the moment it appears not to be affecting the team and not affecting the patient. Next, let's talk about Miss Bossy, our formal in, for informal leader who we all look to in times of change or announcement to see how we should react, the tribal leader. So being the informal leader is, in itself is not the crime. It's about whether they're using that power for good or for evil. Let's take an example. Our Bossy is someone who feels like they're above doing any work a lot of the time. They're the chief in the kitchen and no one will come anywhere near them when they know what they're doing. They make all of the decisions. They're always the team leader when they're on shift. There's not a lot of collaboration. In fact, it's fair to say that there's none. 
their leadership style certainly comes under the autocratic box as opposed to something that's more, more collaborative. Communication is an interesting concept. Certainly the team is told and not asked. For example, if overtime is needed, then it sometimes feels like it's assumed you'll just do it unless you say otherwise. But in her defence, if you say you can't, she immediately moves on, no grudges held. Patients get the same treatment. She's old school matron style in the way in which she delivers nursing care. Not a lot of cooing before that injection, just a rough, come on, roll over, sir, it's not going to give itself. But people felt like it's a bit like being in the army when she's team leading and there's not a lot of leeway for laughter. So let's pass it through our test. Does it impact team cohesion? In this particular case, it is unpleasant and it politically incorrect. And as old school as she may be in her approach, there's no demean denying that the team functions well under her supervision. Patients are well looked after. In fact, patient flow is tip top. Everybody has their meal breaks. Almost always everybody goes home on time. It's fair to say that people find her style and her communication difficult. And everyone would dearly love to have a little bit more fun on these shifts. But it's hard to find a case in this situation to find that key cohesion is actually impacted negatively. And the patients, well, they're sorted within an inch of their life. So there's no impact there either. So this one gets a tick from me in terms of we give it a pass and let it go through to the keeper. It is one of the ones, however, that's often borderline. And take that communication style a couple of further steps to the right where that communication style is changes and it becomes impactful on that team co cohesion, which is probably the most risk for Miss Bossy, that she is just on the precipice of getting that team to work well, work efficiently and effectively and make sure everything is done. If she just takes it a few steps further, then it's likely that team cohesion is deteriorated because she pushes it so far. So it is one of those ones that the bossy with that behaviour and that autocratic style with no collaboration and no communication can easily just flick into the cross and that it does need addressing. Miss Bossy, uh, Miss Busy. As I said earlier, Miss Busy does my head in. So I've already shown my bias here. But all that blustering around without actually completing a task. And if you look closely at Miss Busy, then we can certainly hear her little feet scampering around everywhere, but her patients are constantly on the buzzer. Now, you may answer a couple of her buzzers for her and her patients are fairly irritated. The nurse said she'd be back with my pain relief and that was an hour ago. You go to Miss Busy and she's aghast because she's forgotten and there's a litany of reasons as to why it's so hard for her to get back to that patient, but really she just forgot. So you go and you do the analgesia for her. You answer the next buzzer and it's the daughter of a demented patient who and the daughter has just arrived and she is furious. Her mother reeks of old urine. How long has my mother been lying in her own urine? You head back out to Miss Busy and she says, yes, but the patient in bed four is, he's really very peri arrest and he's, I really feel like he's in trouble and I've had to basically special him for the last hour. So you go to bed four and yes, that patient is indeed quite sick. In fact, you get the sense that the PE that they've been worried about for a couple of days now has finally shown itself. You look over the OBS and it's clear that this has been brewing for some time today in this shift and possibly could have been nipped in the bud a while ago. So you go to the team leader and get her to reallocate some of the nurses to help out both the lady in urine and bed four. Need I go on? Team, team cohesion is clearly a mess because everyone is following behind Miss Busy to clean up what she's missed. Patients are most certainly been affected both directly and indirectly. Clearly, Miss Busy's patients are well behind the eight ball at this stage of her shift. But now everybody else's patient care has been put on hold while two or maybe three nurses are mobilised to sort out these major problems that have bloomed from Miss Busy's busyness. So this one is something that definitely needs to be addressed and it is often behavioural. Sometimes 
it's knowledge, sometimes it's skill, but a lot of the time it's behavioural and that behaviour needs to be addressed. Knowledge. Like I said before, we are hungry for more experts. We are always feeling like we are skill poor in our, when we're talking about skill mix in our clinical settings. And certainly nurses feel that novices are enormous resource drain and so the solution would certainly be no, more knowledge. But like I said before, sometimes too much of a good thing can be a, a problem and it's how they use that knowledge, whether they're using it for good or evil. Now, Miss Know-it-all here loves to sprout her knowledge and to be fair, she backs it up. She certainly is a highly skilled, very knowledgeable nurse and never once has she put any doubt in anyone's mind that she can't walk the talk. Problem is that she seems to feel that she's the only one who can properly care for patients. A bit of the God complex, perhaps. She fixes it so that she has the sickest patients or any patient that deteriorates. And she suddenly asked the previous nurse to the day seven hip she was looking after five minutes ago, and she's front and centre. She's taken the portfolio of education for the department as well. And recently, there was a decision that this ward would take BiPAP. So she delivered an in-service on BiPAP. And everyone walked out of that in-service more bamboozled after than then when they walked in. It was more like BiPAP 207 than BiPAP 101. Now, if we pass this through the test, then she will pass team cohesion. The team is quite in awe of her knowledge and certainly wouldn't connect, can question it. She's more than proven herself. But if you look more carefully, there's a patient imperative here that does need to be considered. Miss Knowledge isn't in the department 24-7. So when it does happen, when patients deteriorate and she's not around to save the day, how's that going to work? Skill development and skill continuity is essential. Everybody needs to be constantly looking after the sick or the complex patients so when the time comes that no one around is around that's more experienced, then they're up for it. Misknowledge is putting long-term patient care at risk by always stepping in and not delivering the education effectively at the level that people understand to advance their skill level. That need to control and exclude everybody else is a problem. People need to grow and they need to continue their skill set. And if it's all about misknowledge, then that's going to be a problem. So that gets the cross from me and therefore something that needs to be addressed. Now, lazy, there's probably not much to, to really explore here. There's no good version of lazy. And if people aren't pulling their weight, then there's no excuse for it. Run it past our test and it gets the thumb down on both counts. Team members are frustrated that they have to pull, pick up the load. Patients receive sloppy care. There's no arguing that lazy is a no-brainer for something that needs to be addressed. But sometimes things are a little bit more complex, like critical. So we all know that critical scrutinising eye, and it's so frustrating and it's so incredibly annoying. It's the nurse who points out what you did wrong, even though you've just been discussing how you know how wrong it truly did go, who kindly appears to fix your patient when you've stepped away for two seconds to get them a warm blanket and you walk back into the room and there she is, with the family who is delighted she saved the day and she's there armed with a blanket and a hot cup of tea and she looks judgingly scornful as she pushes past you. She points out that you've got the pethidine page open as you've just realised that yourself and was about to turn to the correct page, the morphine. It's the nitpicking, micromanaging, critical person that's all over you all the time. For our test, it can be a bit of a struggle. There's no doubt that this is possibly the most irritating behaviour on the planet. Passive aggressive, maybe obnoxious, almost certainly. But truly, is it impacting team cohesion? Most miscriticals that I've been exposed to are super annoying, but it doesn't necessarily impact team cohesion until it's very, very extreme. Sometimes I'll admit it's a line ball. Everyone's so focused on how annoyed they are that Miss Critical is constantly all over them like a rash and pointing out their failures 
that they're not truly engaged in their nursing work. But again, I would call that a line ball. And certainly the patients are rarely to be impacted. In fact, they're getting double the care, one from their nurse and again from the scrutinising eye of Miss Critical. And she never lets anything go wrong. She's always looking and catches things early. So in effect, it's hard to argue that the patient is being impacted. So for the most part, times Miss Critical might get a pass. But again, similarly to how I said earlier, there are times when you take that just a couple of steps further where that critical, unpleasant behaviour does tend to start impacting co team cohesion and the team does feel very unhappy with that behaviour. And that's only probably a few steps from what I've described to you. And at that point, that's when it needs to be addressed. Now, brutal. The notion of political correctness never found its way to our Miss Brutal. And she's got an acid tongue that doesn't hold back. And she's in one of the danger categories, a little bit there also with Miss Critical, that often gets shifted into the bullying and harassment level. It's one of the bad behaviours where they're in a high-risk category for being uh, pushed into that criminal area of bullying and harassment. So this person really does need to be very, very careful. No one is going to excuse, accuse Miss Bully or know it all of bullying them but Miss Brutal, yes. So again, outside the scope of this presentation, but what we're talking about is when it is annoying, problematic, unpleasant, but not unreasonable. But sometimes the brutal can go into that unreasonable. But in this situation, Miss Brutal comes along one day and finds an ECG on the nurse's station that is wildly irregular. And she hands it to the doctor who happens to be in the ward doing ward round. He promptly tells her he's never seen this ECG and he's already seen this patient so rightly demands what on earth is going on. Patient care is re reviewed, replanned, all is in order but Miss Brutal heads straight up to the nurse looking after that patient and gives her quite the old school dressing down. Again not unreasonably. She didn't humiliate, she didn't do it in front of others, her language was appropriate but it was a very parent-child conversation. The nurse is in tears and Miss Brutal, quite predictably, has added to her long-established reputation for this sort of behaviour. Now, if we pass it through our test, it's actually not an easy one. If the nurse's care was sloppy, arguably she needed the feedback. If her care was known to be sloppy, then it's possible that Miss Brutal has had the guts to say what everybody else was thinking. The danger here is what I call the that's her syndrome. When we first arrive in a clinical setting and are confronted by our, the wards or the departments Miss Brutal, we walk away and often think, oh, which? And it's an unpleasant first couple of months while we navigate Miss Brutal's behaviour. Eventually, though, as human beings, we get to know Miss Brutal and we start to rationalise her behaviour as we become more accustomed to it. Now we've been in the department for a while and other newcomers come and they've walked away thinking, what a witch, what's her problem? And we say things to the newcomers like, oh, I found her terrible too when I first came here, but don't worry, you get used to it, that's just her. Or there are other excuses like, oh, but she's great in an emergency. Or, well, you know, she can be a pill, but if I was here as a patient, I'd want her looking after me. Or things like, yeah, I know she can be difficult, but she's just got really high expectations. Just ignore her. So the team is arguably well cohered, but only the old ones that have run her gauntlet and survived to live on the other side. If you're in a situation where newcomers find it hard to get through into that inner sanctum and people are leaving early and bouncing when they come, then, and it's because Miss Brutal is too difficult a task to pass, the test to pass, then you've got team her cohesion problems and the behaviour needs adjusting. Patients are unlikely to be compromised by Miss Brutal, but they will find her manner difficult and it's likely that patient complaints about her manner are common. So again, another area that might trigger action. So it's an interesting one, but whether intuitively the team can let this behaviour pass because they get used to it and they realise that it's not out of malice, but it doesn't excuse the bad behaviour. 
and if it is impacting team cohesion in that you can't keep new staff or the patients find her manner too aggressive, then it's time to deal with it. So that's the first thing you need to do. We've defined the bad behaviour and now we've put each in bad behaviour to the test. And you can do that with any situation about does it affect team cohesion, does it affect patient care. Then we have to move on to challenging it. And sometimes a lot of people say, why is it my job? Why, why am I the one that has to challenge? And there's a couple of reasons. And they're the four. Stop tolerations, have our needs met, set boundaries, raise our standards. And I'm going to talk about each of those a little bit further. Tolerations is something that's quite difficult, that we just slowly tolerate things and let them go and let them go through to the keeper. I'm going to take a home example here, and it's an extreme example that I'm sure none of you have ever experienced in your life where you do all of the cooking and your husband does none. I know, it's an out there example. But one day you've worked an early shift in the ward and five minutes before you are due to go off, one of your patients has an arrest. It's a terrible outcome. The patient passes away. You've spent time with the family. You've debriefed with the team, but you're an hour and a half late. You pick up the kids from after school care who are not happy. You've realised that it's too late now to defrost the chicken breast from the fridge, so you duck in and do the shopping and quickly get some foods that you can cook tonight. You've got them home. You've got them on their homework. You've found the lost lunchbox. you put the groceries away, and your husband comes home from his RDO and playing golf with his mates, and he says, geez, starting dinner late. Inwardly, you want to scream, but it's something that you have tolerated for so long, you have made dinner every single night for 742 occasions, why would you crack it on the 743rd? And so when people who continue to have tolerations like that, they have mediocre performance. I imagine that dinner that you cook is not going to be a master chef creation. In fact, it will be lucky to be baked beans on toast that doesn't hit him in the lap on the way through. You're tired. You, when he walks in and says, oh, it's starting dinner, right? You will just feel an overwhelming sense of fatigue and there will be no creativity. Say, instead, on the 743th third time, it is the day that you absolutely crack it and you give him an ultimatum and say, this cooking thing's got to end, we're doing it 50-50, and he agrees. And then a month later, the same thing occurs where you're on shift Five minutes before you go home, patient arrests, terrible outcome, and you drive home. This time you come home to children that have been picked up, that are showered, have done their homework, the groceries are done, and being served on the table is duck a l'orange made by your husband who has embraced cooking. People who have stopped tolerating show different behaviours. They're happy. You are absolutely delighted when you walk in with duck a l'orange you are much more enjoyable to be around in that situation than you were a month ago. You find a lot of energy and you put energy into your values. Now you sit at a dinner table with your family and you have a conversation about how everybody's day is. And it's not about your ego, about why do I have to be the one cooking? It's so unfair. It's so frustrating you having all of these thoughts. And you have an edge. And it's exactly the same with bad behaviours. If you are tolerating Miss Brutal or you are tolerating Miss Critical or you are tolerating Miss Knowledge, she's taking all of the cases and turning you out into the backlands, then you have a mediocre performance. You're tired and there's no creativity there. When you have removed that from your working environment, then you are happier, more enjoyable to be around and find energy to put into your values, who you are as a nurse and not, whom did what to whom. Same with our needs that are met. We all have needs, air, food, water, shelter, safety, but we have professional needs as well. When a person's professional needs are not met, then time is constantly wasted in trying to get them partially met. Now, misknowledge is a good example here. You want to grow professionally, but you never get a chance to take difficult cases and complex cases and you spend all of this time wasting trying to find other ways and doing it and get around them and stop them getting the other cases and it's never, you never really get your needs fully met. And you attract needy people. People who don't get their needs met attract needy people. 
It means when you walk into the tea room frustrated that once again you weren't allowed to take the complex patient, then there's a needy person who wants to have a conversation about whinging about that because the water is warm and you jump in because the water is warm. Whereas people who do have their professional needs met have the brain space for other people and their needs. If you are in a place where you are growing professionally, then you automatically have a sense of altruism. And so you have the brain space to be able to share your knowledge with others. There's no competing anymore. And you gain a confidence without arrogance. Right now, Miss Knowledge is showing an excellent example of what it's like to have self-confidence with arrogance. But when you have your needs met, then you have self-confidence, full stop. Setting boundaries means that you meet your values and you have your integrity met. Now, Miss Critical, who walks all over you and you do nothing about it, men, but it means that you feel like you can't do anything right without someone looking over your shoulder and that you are completely mis being micromanaged is a place of utter frustration. And you feel judged every time she tells you what you haven't done. But it often means that if you don't challenge that, then you haven't set those boundaries and said, no, I won't tolerate that level of criticism. A person with weak boundaries attracts needy, disrespectful people into your life. Are those needy, disrespectful people in your ward will pick up on the fact that you have got that frustration and that you are have no boundaries and they will seek to encroach on those boundaries for their own psychological benefit as well. You waste energy trying to keep life going in status quo and trying to counteract what she might criticise you on and make all these efforts to try and stop her saying it in the first way. You're wasting all of this energy running around instead of just doing your job. You teach people how to treat you. And that's when the person with boundaries means that their fear diminishes and that trust is really an issue. And respect flows and people grow emotionally and they grow professionally. And all of those things put together means that we raise our standards, most importantly. And one of the things is why when it becomes what I asked you before about when it's your role and when it's your mum's role, and that's when we start talking about performance management versus performance nudging. I call it performance nudging. Performance management is, of course, an ongoing process of formal communication between a supervisor and an employee that occurs in a yearly cycle. It requires planning, checking in, review. And discipline is often the, in the workplace is that supervisory personnel correct behavioural deficiencies and allow adherence to established company rules. It is a very formal process, as it should be. Performance nudging is the pre-work to performance management. It's the softer approach where you give people the natural justice and the natural opportunity to self-resolve before you bring in the big guns. You're doing the groundwork and the informal work so that the numb can do the formal work later on in the performance management cycle. It's a gentle, informal, friendly, compassionate and purposeful way of gently nudging someone's performance to where you need it to be. Whereas performance is formal, confronting and stressful. Certainly discipline is. If you took, say, Miss Critical's behaviour to your nurse manager, um, or a better example is Mr Quirky and his, what you deem as his shoe fetish, and never gave him the opportunity to have that conversation with you, then the conversation with the nun is always stressful. Every time I've ever said, you know, Joe, can I have a chat with you, please? And I shut the door and people see the door shut. They look at me and they go, oh, what have I done? Instantly stressed. They don't listen to anything that I have to say until they hear whether this conversation is good news or bad news. It isn't productive and it isn't a place of growth and it isn't a safe place. It's often something that is quite confrontational. And it isn't something that provides fertile ground for people to change. Whereas when you take the opportunity to do a little bit of performance nudging, then things that have never been pointed out to people have the opportunity in a more safe environment to be pointed out to them and they have the opportunity to self-correct. So your role is not performance management, but it is performance management, performance nudging to give them the chance. 
Now, if you are going to have that conversation with them, then there is a formula for it and a challenge to a to a bad behaviour that they're exhibiting usually is constructed of these six pieces. Um, so compassion is, if without compassion, you're likely to set up a very adversarial conversation. If you go straight in and say, I don't like the way you just spoke to me, then it's likely to set up the conversation as a little us and them and a little parent and child, what you're trying to set up as an adult to adult conversation. Now, nurses, we're dealers of compassion, which is our core business. So it shouldn't be hard for us to deploy that emotion. Accountants, if I was talking to a group of accountants, then I might have to spend some more time on compassion. But for nurses, we do compassion very, very well. It's the edge that you need to bring with that compassion that might be a little bit more challenging. And the edge is the message that you're only interested in their best efforts to find change, growth and excellence and that you're not willing to tolerate a mediocre effort. Now, you've run it through your test. It's damaging team cohesion and or patient care. So you're armed with some good material here to them to say, I'm only interested in your best efforts to find change for the team and or for the patient. You come into this conversation in the belief that they have potential for action, but it must be gracious and smooth. Masterful challenges are graceful, smooth, sensitive and respectful. So you might say, what you're doing is good, but it's not your best. Don't say you're going to change unless you're going to do it. Our team needs you to change. Our team, our patients need you to change. And you must deliver an expectation. People want change, but they are beha behaving badly because it works for them at some level. So the bad behaviour is getting something out of it. Satisfaction, release for their rage or frustration, indulge their laziness and get out of work, their love of drama and busyness. They are getting out of something out of it. So you're, you have to set an expectation and plant a seed of what it could look like with that, that bad behaviour. And you might say something like, what I'd like for you is that you can work a shift here without being so busy that you're in overwhelm all the time. Or what I'd like for you is that you're able to enjoy, people enjoy being in your company and don't give you a wide berth because you are too truculent to be around. And you make a, an actual request of them and you mark more of a request than you think is reasonable because that will stretch them to their best. You're trying to get a large shift and a large change and growth in their attitude. So you're immune, and it's important to focus on their strengths. You're a very gentle, nurturing person, yet you give directions to the AIN in such a militant manner. It doesn't fit with your compassionate nature. Why don't you try and collaborate with your AINs, talk with him about what you think he thinks needs to happen with the patient instead of just ordering them and see what works. Obviously, it has to be respectful. Respect is about esteem, admiration, acceptance and courtesy. Deploy these in the conversation to balance the good with the bad. And later on, evidence. It's about follow-up. Watch for evidence of change. You've determined that this has impacted team and your patient. So you need to be looking for outward signs and proof that's plainly seen by others. So later in the challenge, a week later perhaps, you might say something like, tell me what's changed since we last spoke. How many people have told you that you're noticeably coming across better? How many fewer problems have you experienced as a result of the change? And how do you feel about the changes that you've made? Now, that's the point at which the evidence is key because that's the point that's the trigger to escalate it to the numb. If you've made the challenge and you've followed that formula and you've not seen evidence, then you might give them another chance and have that conversation again. And in failing that, then that's the time that you go to the numb and you make it a more performance management, not performance nudging and saying, I've tried this, we've had this conversation, and these are the situations and problems that we're still having. And it's an important part of the cycle so that we can have a team that has got great team cohesion delivering exceptional patient care. So I, as always, have put a range of resources on my website with uh, my website, Nurse Manager HQ, slash challenge, um, hashtag one, um, with a couple of things and resources that you can use 
um, as well as this formula and a couple of other tools and strategies that you can use to help apply this model. Nicole, thank you very much for an exceptional webinar. My pleasure. <laughs> so many points to so many points to touch on. Um, and I would encourage you to go to Nicole's website because she does have a, a large number of resources available for people and um, certainly is always happy to talk as well, Nicole. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. So today we've been listening to Nicole Nash-Arnold from Nurse Manager HQ in the first of her series, uh, in the first of her challenge series. So we look forward to seeing you online at the next webinar very soon. Have an exceptional day. Bye-bye.